Today we're finishing up the series Owned is what we're finishing up. Owned. Um, so we did Owned last week and then we'll finish up the series, just a two-week series. Next week's Christmas at the Movies, like Pastor Taylor was telling. The week after that, I don't know if you've seen or noticed renovations online. If you don't have kids and brick kids, you probably haven't noticed just yet if you haven't seen it online. But we're renovating. And so before we even talk more about what's happening on the 31st, I need to tell you thank you. Thank you for being a type of church that invites because y'all are giving me as a pastor good problems, right? There are problems that life throws at you, and the kind of problems I want to have are growth problems. We have too many kids and brick kids. We didn't have space, so we had to make space. We're able to renovate, so thank you for inviting. And on the 31st, we're actually going to be renovating in the auditorium and so we need the extra time so it's a it's a Sunday off you just get to be off you don't have to do anything you have permission from your pastor to rest you have permission if you if rest for you looks like going to another church and just worshiping do that if rest looks like doing whatever you want to do stay in your pajamas rest on the 31st because we won't meet here in the in person because we'll be renovating we'll be in the process of tearing down the auditorium because again good problems you guys are inviting we got no room in here to grow so we're adding space in the auditorium as well and which leads me to my next point of thank you. Um, thank you for being faithful generously. Um, you guys have been financially faithful, and so we don't have to beg or plead. Um, we've just been trying to be good stewards of every dollar to do everything we can, and so we're able to come and just renovate and tell you about it and tell you all the good things that God is doing. So thank you for being faithful. But now we are in uh, owned, owned week number two. Last week we talked about your value and how you, if you're a follower of Christ, th- those of you who are here and you're like, I follow Jesus, I've counted the cost, I trust him with my life, it means you're owned by him. Now, if you're in the wrestle, Pastor Taylor talked about how um, we want this to be a place you can belong before you believe. Maybe you're in the wrestle. This is a good spot for that. You're still figuring out your faith, whether you believe Jesus is who he says he is, whether you really follow him wholeheartedly yet or not, and that's fine, but once you've got to that spot where you've counted the cost, you've signed on the dotted line, you've committed your life to Jesus, Scripture says that we're owned. It says it like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and you are not your own. For you were bought at a price, therefore therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You are owned. You are owned by him, and he paid the highest price. Uh, you, You have value that you can't even fathom. Like, we don't understand. He calls us a masterpiece. Not because we're awesome, not because we did something awesome, but because of what he's done for us and the value he's placed in us. All right, so you, uh, and the best way to do that is to stay in his hands. If you have value, it means you have something to do with that value. You need to respect that value. If you own something that's valuable, you usually take good care of it. There's a line in a movie called Spider Man that if you have, with great power comes great responsibility. Any Spider Man fans? 10 o'clock? Okay, all right, all right. 8 30 was like, I don't even, we watch documentaries. We don't watch Spider Man. We don't know what you're talking about. You guys are into it. Um, and so, uh, w- but, but I would argue that scripturally with great value comes great responsibility. That, that, w- that you have value in you and to respect that value and to agree with God about your value, right? You don't always have to feel like it. Some days I wake up, I don't feel very valuable. Some things I, sometimes I do stuff and I realize I'm not very valuable. And yet God still says, while I did all my stupid stuff, he has value in me. And last week we ended with this idea that you need to just be in his hands. Just trust God with your life and find your value come, become more evident to you, more evident to the world. That If you'll just stay trusting him to own you, to, to do all the things he's called to do in your life, he will bring out the value that was already there, the way that you were designed to be. And so today what I want to talk about is, is, is how to stay there. Right? You, you have great value, and I really want to talk about the, the values that keep us there and our own values to stay there, the values that have that keep us there. It says it like this in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober and alert. Your enemy, the devil, like a roaring lion, is on the prowl looking for someone to devour. Be sober and alert. Uh, this idea of sober is not about uh, just the intake of alcohol or pills or smoke. It's really about clear-minded. Be clear-minded. Be aware of what's going on, who you're called to be, what you want to be in the future. Be alert because there is, there is something out there. There is a being out there that we don't like to talk about a whole lot, but he is looking for an opportunity to trip you up. He's looking for an opportunity to trap you, and he would love to take you out. He would love to put those shackles that you, that you got set free from. When you decided to be owned by Jesus, he, he decided to, to, that you, you were following him and you were letting go of the shackles of all of your sin and your guilt and your shame. And Satan is over there just waiting, 
open shackles, trying to lure you, looking for an opportunity, just prowling, looking for an option. Now, I don't, I don't, I don't like to talk about Satan a whole lot just because we, we give him too much credit. The second we start talking about him, some of you are just going to blame him for everything. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to be the one to break it to you. Like, that wasn't, that wasn't him. That was you. You know what I'm saying? Like, ah, oh, man, Satan really got at me today. I was yelling at my kids. No, that, that, that was you. That wasn't Satan. <laughs> You know, Satan's really, I'm, all, I'm dragging today. I was, I was really struggling. Satan's just trying to, trying to come at me. Like, no, that was because you stayed up till 3 a.m. That wasn't Satan. You know, like most of the time, Satan gets credit for stuff. He's like, I didn't even do that. I don't know what they're talking about. Like, but there are things in which this scripture tells us he's, he's on the hunt. You know what I'm saying? He's like, ah, just, you know what I'm saying? Just like, I'm going to get somebody in here. Just, uh. And we have this picture of Satan kind of like that. He's got, he's red and he's got horns. I don't know where that comes from, but we do believe that for some reason. And he just, ah, ah just out here angry. But Satan prowling uh, is more like temptation. Uh, m- more like uh, he's on the edge of wherever we're at with just a, a nice piece of candy. You know what I'm saying? Like we're little kids and we're suckered by candy. I mean, even as adults, I like a good piece of candy. But he's like just waiting. And that candy that, he would, that we would go after would be the very thing that he enables him to put the shackles right back on us. There are things he's trying to lure us. And, and the reason I don't want to give him credit is because he's on the outside. He, he can't get us unless we go to him. Unless we fall for his traps, he can't get us. We, we are safe and secure in God's hands unless we decide to be like, all right, let me go see what kind of candy he's got over here. I mean, it sounds kind of good. I mean, it looks kind of delicious. It might be a fun time to do what I used to do. It might be a fun time to try it again, the sin that I had to, to date the type of people that hurt me before, to say the things I used to say, to talk the way I used to talk. It might be good to, to just, just test it out. Maybe I'm better at it this time and go right back. He, we are safe and secure as long as we don't fall into his traps right? Uh, for, for most of American Christianity, uh, we kind of live real haphazard, right? We, we live like, and I, I don't know about the rest of the world. The rest of the world's probably persecuted. I grew up in the American church. So that's the only one I can really talk about. But what I've seen in our churches is people come to Christianity and following Jesus like it's a playground. Just like, ah, we're just out here playing around. You know what I'm saying? Watch what I can do. Look what I can do. It's monkey bars, just having a good time. I got the joy of the Lord. You know, I'm, I'm so blessed. And all of these things that we just, we live very uh, haphazard in our life. Like there's not really any, any danger to us. We're on this playground where we got Satan on the outskirts waiting to trap us back in again. We're, we're on this playground of life and we think that it's just this fun life. And, and, and the thing is, there are things about following Jesus that are good and beautiful and wonderful and he wants us to have. But then he also says, be alert. Like, yes, make sure you stay within the boundaries of this playground that is following me, that is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. But don't fall into the trap. Don't get sucked in. But some of us live like it don't even matter. Like I can run where I want, do what I want, have what I want, say what I want, be what I want, because I, I got Jesus. You know what I'm saying? We're just all good. There, there's danger out there. You have to be careful. I'll give you an example. My kids uh, um, don't believe me. I don't know. I've never lied to them in their life. I yet, I've yet that I know of have lied to them, and they don't believe me about nothing, about anything I tell them. They just don't believe me. We, and, and the thing that makes me most nervous right now at this age, five and eight, is the parking lots. Parking lots terrify me because I don't trust none of y'all driving. I don't trust me driving either. It's okay. I've seen, I've seen how y'all back out. I'm pretty sure some of y'all don't look at nothing. You're just like, I'm moving. I hope everybody else is too. You know, just, just look, don't even look in the rear view. Like, did you know you're in reverse when you're driving? Just zooming through parking lots. Y'all know there are lines to drive through. Don't, don't just drive wherever you want. You got to pay attention. And so I tell my kids, like, be alert and put your head on a swivel. Like, pay attention. That's what I tell them. I teach them what put your head on the swivel is. It's like, we're watching around. You know what my kids do? Like, I'm like, these kids, are, th- these, these cars are huge. They will kill you. They will kill you. And I don't know how much fear to, is, is the appropriate amount of fear to instill in them. Do I tell them that it could squash their head like a melon? That feels like it's too far. Like, it feels too aggressive, but I need you to understand it. Every time we go out to a parking lot, just like, ha, ha, dad said, keep his head on us. Well, let's run. You ready to run? Ah, let's get out there. I'm like, what? I, li- I mean, we haven't even stepped off of the curb, and I'm like, hey, y'all, we're in a parking lot. We're about to be in a parking lot. Chill. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, Dad, yeah, Dad. Boom. Ha, ha, what are we, gonna, what are we doing now? Ha, 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 I just run in a muck, and I'm like, what are y'all, what is wrong with you? Like, do you, not, do you not trust me when I say be alert, that this thing can kill you? And most of us live our Christianity like that. We live this, like, 
Jesus is saying, be sober and alert. We're like, yeah, I'll be kind of sober. <laughs> I'm going to be a little buzzed. You know what I'm saying? Because, ah, playground. Like, I'm going to be kind of alert. I mean, God's got me. I got people. I got ways to get recovered. But no, 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 no. We got, we got stuff to do. There's, there's a mission. There's a, there's a destination God has for us. And if we're living haphazardly, we don't really see the value in what God has in us. We don't really believe that God has said we're, our future is valuable, our call is valuable, that we really need to pay attention. That, that maybe he'll get us out of it. Maybe we can get trapped again and we can get out of the jam, but maybe we missed out on all the things we could have been doing. How much further could we have gone if we didn't spend a couple years trapped? And so today, I, I want to I bring up three traps. Three traps that are, are true about this season of life, like Christmas time that we might get trapped into, that might get sucked into, but are pretty much true all, all the time. So I want to apply it to Christmas season, but also your whole life. And the first one is this. The first trap that all of us are susceptible to is man's opinion. Man's opinion. There, there is this, ah, oh, Jesus is good, but also we're, we're looking at the outskirts of the playground and wanting them to watch us and approve what we're doing. Like, did, did you see me on those monkey bars? I was skipping two and three at a time, bro. Did you see that? How cool am I? Like, we live our life like what everybody else thinks about our Christianity is what matters. Like, everybody else telling me, affirming how I'm living for Jesus or whether my family looks good enough is, is really what we're living up to. And before you know it, you're getting closer and closer to the outskirts of the playground. You're missing out on what God has for you because you can't, you can't have it both ways. Uh, Paul says it like this in Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. Am I now trying to gain the approval of people or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a slave of Christ. We like to have it both ways, where I can, I can make everybody happy, and I can live up to everybody's expectation of my life, and make God happy, and do what God has called me to do. But Paul is saying, no, no, no. If my life is about man's opinion, then my life is not about God's call. I can't be a fully devoted follower of Christ and also simultaneously live up to everyone's expectations for my life. And it's not that, it's not that you're like going to do better at bringing their opinions along. It's that you're getting further and further away from caring about what they think about you because you care more and more about what God says about you. That you step further and further away. You just take steps. I'm not saying tomorrow you're going to wake up and just not care. You're going to actually just take one step at a time to say, all right, God, I'll do what you've called me to do. I'll live how you've called me to live, no matter if it makes everybody else happy, no matter if everybody else thinks I'm right. And look, this isn't justification to just do whatever you want, because I know there's some of your personalities. You're like, cool, I'll just do what I want. I don't care what nobody thinks. No, no, you need to seek godly wisdom. You need to have some people around you that can help you see your blind spots. There are going to be areas of your life that you think it's totally right, totally justified, and you're going to yell at people, tell everybody how they're wrong. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is that with your life, with your actions, you reflect the type of person who is constantly looking to have the value in you reflected in trusting God more, living for him more, constantly doing all the things that God has called you to, no matter what everybody else wants you to do. Not living up to their expectations, but his. In the Christmas season, for some of you may see how man's opinion is starting to direct your life. It's starting to direct what things you do with your life. How, how, how you buy presents. You may, may only be now realizing that you're thinking about not what God has called you to do with the gifts that you give your kids or your family, but how it's going to look to your neighbor, how it's going to look to the people at work. You're taking them shots of all them tree, all them, all them presents under the tree, making sure Instagram sees how, how your house looks, make sure that everybody knows how beautiful the lights are on your house, and make sure you show off what Christmas and how holly jolly you are because you care more about what everybody is thinking about you than what God has called you to do this Christmas. I'm all for it. I'm all for all the excitement, all the joy, all the commemoration of what Christmas is, and you can go over the top. I'm just challenging you to make sure that you going over the top is about pointing people to Jesus. It's about caring about the things of God in your life, that all the presents that may be under the tree are not about how your kids are going to reflect to other kids at school or how it's going to look to your family, but that you care that it points them back to Jesus. Like, this gift is because I love you, because God loves you, because this gift matters. I want to get you good stuff, not because I care what everybody else thinks, but because I'm called to this thing. This season will get you trapped in debt. You'll be sucked in trying to live up to everybody else's expectation. And we've got fancy excuses for it. Don't get me wrong. We've got all kinds of excuses like, man, I, would, I mean, I would like lower the gifts. But my kids don't deserve that. 
My kids deserve to have a really big special Christmas. I'm not going to talk about the, a Dollar Tree Christmas. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to do a handmade Christmas because that's embarrassing. Oh, it's, em- it's embarrassing. It's not about what's best for your kids because I would venture to bet what would be best for our kids if we're in debt up to our ears and we can't pay the bills and we're going to have a stressful life. I, I would bet it would be better to have a hard conversation with them to say, listen, here's what Christmas is really about. Here's what matters most and here's why this year mom and dad are going to do something different. We're, we're going to tone it down a little bit because we believe in the freedom financially that God has called us to have. And this is what Christmas is really supposed to be about. So we're going to make it about the relationships, not about the stuff. And so when you start to think about it, do you want to give your kids the best or do you want to look like you're giving your kids the best? Because if it's for the looks, it's for the opinions. You're trapped into it. So here's what I'd argue. If, if you're saying, all right, that's me. Uh, the first trap is me. I'm, I'm a sucker for man's opinion. What everybody else thinks about me guides my life. The, the practical way I would get out of it is make sure that you have more of God's voice, less of their voice. The practical way I would step away from man's opinion towards God's opinion is have less of their voice in your life. It, it may mean over here you have no Instagram, no Facebook, or definitely less Facebook, less Instagram. That you're not about posting so everybody can see. You're posting because you're happy with your family and you want everybody else to partake in the joy. Not because you want to impress anybody, but because you love your family. You want other people to get to participate. That's why you would do that. Or you just stay away from it altogether because you know it's a trap for you. It's that piece of candy where he's going to put shackles right back on you. You say less of man's opinion. It may be movies you watch that help remind you of all the things that you want to have and how you want to look. It may be jobs you take. Just whatever voices would draw you away from God's opinion, now start drawing closer to God. In, in the music you listen to and how often, what are you looking at most? Are, are you listening to sermons and scripture and things that God has for you more? Is it always Facebook, always Instagram, and you're wondering why it's the loudest voice? It's the loudest voice because it's always in front of your face. So maybe the, the, the way out of this trap is to stay closer into God's opinion, closer into God's plan for your life, closer, and you hear his voice more often than you hear the world's voice. The second thing that is a trap, the second thing that we might get trapped to, especially this season, is the stuff. It's just the stuff itself. Like all of the, all the ways in which we think that stuff will make us happy, that stuff is going to bring us joy, that if we just had more stuff, and it's not just Christmas, it is important at Christmas because we think our kids are going to be happy if we buy them this gift and they'll play with it for like a day and then they'll, you'll, it'll sit in the closet for a year until you throw it out, right? Like, oh, they're going to really love this and they say they do. They say it's the most important thing ever and it really matters and they play with it for like 10 minutes and you're really mad about it because you're like, you swore this was the most important gift ever because just like them, we're, we're suckers for this too. We want to we talk about kids and their gift. Let's talk about us and like how we told ourselves once we got to this salary, then we're going to be good. And then once you got there, it was like, but I just, just a little more, you know, inflation and stuff. I got I to gotta have just a little bit more than that. You know what I'm saying? Like once we get to this, then I'll be happy. Once I have this relationship, I'll be happy. Once I get this stuff, once I get to this vehicle, once I get to this neighborhood, once my yard looks like this, we have all of these things that tell us we're going to be happy when we get there. And we have to recognize, like, it is just an allure, and it is just a shiny thing that is a fake trap that will convince us that we'll have joy when we get there. And we find out and admit that all the stats prove it. There's never enough. And see, there's this moment in Scripture where Jesus is talking about us producing something, that he's placed something in our life that we have value, and he's placed a word in our life, and there's something we're supposed to produce with our life. And he says that he uses this parable of seeds, and the first uh, heart, heart posture is this hard ground, and the seed just goes away. It doesn't, it doesn't plant at all. The second heart posture is a rocky ground, and, and the seed is planted on the rocky ground, and that heart is too worried about persecutions and problems, so it falls away. The third one is a lot like us. And that's a a thorny ground. Here's what he says in Matthew chapter 13, verse 22. The seed sown among the thorns is the person who hears the word, but worldly cares and the seductiveness of wealth choke the word, so it produces nothing. See, for most of us, what what chokes out the things of God is not the persecution, because the American church isn't really persecuted. What chokes it out is the allure of all the stuff. The allure of all that we think would make us happy. And, and, and in our garden, in our heart, we have, two, we have a conflict. We have the word of God, the value of God, the dreams of God, the plans of God for our life. And then we also have simultaneously in the same garden this idea that this other stuff would make us happy. That this other stuff would bring us joy. And God is saying, no, 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 I, <laughs> the joy of the Lord is your strength, not the joy of your stuff. 
God is saying, no, no, that, that stuff is fake. That stuff is going to make you think that you're producing or think that you're good for a moment, but it will not satisfy. And, and it's choking out the word of God. It's not producing. And the issue is, is that in this scenario, the thorny ground, the thorny bush can look pretty. The, the, the thorny areas look like they're producing something. Plants are coming up and it seems like it's doing, but it's not producing anything but thorns. And for many of us, our life looks good to the world around us. And, and we're so, we've, we've spent time gathering stuff and, and letting our heart be inundated with the belief that this world would tell us that if we just had this, then we would be satisfied. And it's choking out the word of God in our life. It's choking out all that God wants for us. All the shiny stuff looks like it's producing but it's not. And so the, the question that you kind of have to wrestle with, if this is your trap, if this is the thing that might suck you in, if this is the way Satan's got his candy at the end of the playground, he's trying to get you, the way you've got to really think is, is do I want to look like I'm producing or do I want to actually produce? Because many of us have settled for looking like it. We've settled for making sure that the world thinks that we've got the stuff, that we've really got it all together. And God has called you to actually produce. Sometimes that's tilling up the soil. Sometimes in certain seasons, it doesn't look good to the world because it's underground. It's producing. It's, the seed is breaking and starting to sprout. There's the right nutrients for it. But for everybody else, it's going to look really bad at different seasons of your life when you start to prune, when you start to get the thorns out. I'm like, ooh, they're falling apart. They're selling their stuff. They're falling apart. They're not taking the promotion. They're falling apart. It's, se- it's going to seem like when you're saying yes to God and no to the stuff that you're losing it. But it's you at the beginning stages of actually producing rather than looking like you're producing. And again, I'm not, I, it's not actually about the stuff. It's really about your heart. It's, see, you don't, you don't want, you can have the stuff, you just can't let the stuff have you. It's about where your heart's at. There's this moment, um, two moments actually in scripture uh, in the gospel of Luke, and there's two kind of ex- differences in how God responds and expectations for someone's stuff. The first one is found in Luke 18, and there's this guy called the rich young ruler. And on the outside, the rich young ruler is crushing it. I mean, he, he tells Jesus all the ways in which he's following the laws, following the, he's obedient to the, the call of God on his life. He looks good to everybody else. And he's saying, what, is, what, is, what do I need for eternal life? What do I need to follow you? What does it look like to really produce, right? He's saying, I'm, I, I'm showing that I'm producing. I'm showing, and it looks like to the world that I'm doing something. And Jesus tells the rich young ruler, sell everything you have and come follow me. Because for the rich young ruler, his stuff had his heart. And the only way to follow Jesus was to get rid of the stuff. That Jesus cared enough about his heart to say, get rid of the stuff and trust me. And one of the saddest things in scripture is it said that the rich young ruler walked away sad. Jesus let him walk away sad. And then in, in Luke 19, there's a guy named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus had a lot of stuff too. So you would think Jesus would tell Zacchaeus, hey, you gotta get rid of all your stuff. That's the rule. It's, it's a, a flat, simple rule. We gotta get rid of stuff. We can't have stuff. And Zacchaeus comes to Jesus and says, listen, I've realized who you are. I realize what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to give away anything I've stolen. I'm going to pay it back times four, and I'm going to start giving in this way, and this is how I'm going to do it. He doesn't say I'm going to get rid of all my stuff. I'm just going to give better and be a better steward of what I've been given. I'll be more faithful with what I've been given. And Jesus tells Zacchaeus that salvation has come to his house. That seems, why you got a double standard, Jesus? One guy's got to get rid of all his stuff. The other guy doesn't. That it seems like, like you have a double standard. No, no, because it's about the heart. You can have the stuff. The stuff can't have you. Jesus cares more about having you than about whatever stuff you may have. And so this, this Christmas season, the, the way that you're thinking and the way that you're processing, it's not about the stuff. It's about him. Whether you have a lot of gifts under the tree or very few gifts under the tree, it's about whether or not the stuff has you. Because there are rich people whose stuff don't have them. You, you can be a billionaire. I hope, you, I hope some of you make it to, to, to billionaire status. And I also hope you believe in tithing and still attend this church when you do. Like, I hope, I hope you get there. Because you can get to that level and still recognize, like, this stuff is God's stuff. I'm just a faithful steward of God's stuff. You can get there. Simultaneously, you can be broke and still have the stuff have you. I know it sounds crazy. Like, I ain't got nothing. I'm broke. I'm in debt. Yeah, yeah, but all you're chasing in your life is more stuff. You think the stuff will satisfy you. So it, there's extremes on both ends. God wants your heart, not your stuff. The, the heart position, the scripture says where, where your treasure is, there your heart is going to be also. The, and, he, and he tells one parable and he says, make sure that you are rich towards the things of God. And so today, as you think about your Christmas and your plans and your future, about how you're going to spend at Christmas, how much debt you might want to go into at Christmas, or please don't go into any debt for Christmas. 
Because your future matters enough, your value matters enough to not get trapped. And as you think about all the stuff, you have to think, is this, do I think this stuff will satisfy me? Or, or is this stuff to point my kids back to God, to point my family, my friends back to God? Because the same gift can go either way. The same gift that you give can be the gift that reflects like, I'm giving you this because I love you, because God loved me, and God gave me a gift in Jesus, and this is a great representation of that gift. Very same gift. Other gift, I'm giving this to you because it's awesome, and I want you to have it, and I want you to think it's awesome, and I want you to give me something back, right? You ever had those gifts where people will, like give you, and like, man, you just gave me a guilt trip. Now I got to get you something, right? <laughs> it's just that, that, that same, it's the same gift, but it's about the heart position. Which place are you at? So if that's you and you're wrestling, what I would challenge you to do is to not so much focus on the stuff, but focus on how you leverage the stuff. The wealth that you have, the gifts that you have, the things that you have in your life, that you use his stuff, God's stuff, for his kingdom. The things God gives you. When you're a follower of Christ, you're owned by him. It's supposed to all be his. It's supposed to all be his. Like the, the tithe for me represents the whole. Like everything that I have, I want to be a good steward of every dime that God gives me so that I can be faithful to love my family and the people in my community well. I can be faithful to what God has given me. This stuff is his stuff. So how do I leverage his stuff for his kingdom? That's the stuff you have to look for and check. All right, God, is this about you or about me? Lastly, um, the thing that would trap us most is our emotions. So we have man's opinions. We got the stuff and we've got our emotions. See, in the, with the rich young ruler, um, that story's hard for me to hear. Uh, the, the, the rich young ruler gets to, just has to walk away sad. It, like, Jesus lets him walk away sad. Like, I, I, I read that story, and I think, Jesus, you didn't have to be so hard on him. Right? My emotional process of what's happening in that story, I think, Jesus, you could have started him at 10%. I don't know, start him at 5%. Help the rich young ruler take the step. But Jesus doesn't. Jesus isn't emotionally led in that moment. He does the right thing that's the right thing for that rich young ruler. And that rich young ruler has to make a hard decision. Do you want to follow me or do you want to follow your stuff? And emotionally, I, I could be manipulated into having so much empathy for the rich young ruler that I make caveats for him. I make excuses for him. And I even could enable him and not tell him the hard truth of like, you've got to choose. And there, there, there are situations in the church where people may be frustrated at me or frustrated at the church that I really don't know. I'll never know until we get to heaven if I, was, if I was right about it, if it was the right call to make for a lot of different reasons. But at the same time, there are people where I, I can give you every opportunity, but you have to take the step. I, I can't let my emotions long more for you than what you want for yourself. My emotions, I can't let Satan manipulate my emotions and drag me around wherever he wants. There's a scripture uh, that's the Passion Translation. It's found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, 27. But don't let the passion of your emotions lead you to sin. Don't let anger control you or be fuel for revenge, not even for a day. Don't give the slanderous accuser, the devil, an opportunity to manipulate you. We live in a world where one of the things that Satan is doing really well right now is manipulating our emotions. We go to real extremes. There's this middle ground where, where we trust God and we, we really let him have our emotions. Like the, God is supposed to have our emotions. We don't get to live based on our emotions. Emotions are good, but they can't control our life. But there's this way in which Satan could, could tempt us on either direction. On one direction, it's overly empathetic, right? He uses our empathy as a weapon. He uses our emotions as a weapon. And so for the rich young ruler, it's like, you should feel sorry for him. You should feel sad for him. And before you know it, that empathy becomes enabling. And our emotions drag us into places where we're actually hurting people by just staying silent. We're actually hurting people by justifying their behavior. We're actually hurting people by standing by and letting them be victimized by people that we're making excuses for. Sometimes it's, it, it's that person, if you're that person, you're highly empathetic. You sound kind and you sound nice, but you're hurting people because Satan has manipulated your emotions. They're convinced you that, oh, that's too hard for them. I know they're past. I can know everything about your story and understand why you made your decision but also simultaneously hold you accountable to make the next best decision. It's possible to do that. It's a hard spot to be, but it's possible to hear your story, know your trauma, and know God's got more for you and hold you to a higher standard. Simultaneously, some of you, like me, my personality could be easily manipulated into just truth. Like, I'm be mad at the rich young ruler. What an idiot. 
He had the Son of God right in front of him. What an idiot, right? Like, how dare you pick your stuff over Jesus Christ himself? That sounds really stupid. You, you know you're going to lose your soul, right? Like, you're actually going to end up in hell because you can't give up your stuff when the Son of God is right in front of you asking you to follow him. And I can just, we can just be real harsh with truth and have no empathy whatsoever and just get, just, get, just get galvanized into our stance and we speak only truth and we speak only truth in the harshest way possible. We use it as a weapon, but there's a middle spot where we don't get manipulated by our emotions, but we stand where Jesus stood. And we're sad that they walk away sad, but we let them walk away because they have a free will choice to make. We don't enable them. We don't justify their behavior. We can, behavior, we can understand it. But that doesn't mean we, we get to enable them to continue bad directions. And Satan would like to drag us around to control us until we're galvanized into one stance or another. And God is saying, no, 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 that's a trap too. This season, maybe your emotions lead you to what you're doing next with, with how you give gifts, how you receive gifts, your emotions. You, you, it's really holly jolly. Everything is so exciting and you've got to be really excited. No one can see the back behind the scenes of how you're really struggling. Or you're really grumpy the other way and you're really extreme. It's like, forget Christmas, it's commercialized, I hate all of it. And you're like, maybe let some joy in. Maybe be happy for other people who like Christmas. Don't, maybe don't rain on everybody's parade. You don't have to love it, but you can be happy for other people who do. There's, there's extremes on both sides where God is saying, no, wait, wait. You need to stay. You need to stay in a spot where you think on the good things I have. Here's what it says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. The way you correct your emotions, you see if they line up with Philippians 4.8. Right. Is this does this emotion line up? Because emotions are good. I'm not saying ignore your emotions. You're going to have some emotions that God is trying to get to you and help you see some things clearly. You may be having a really difficult Christmas. You may be you may be you may be missing some loved ones that should be here this year. And it's okay to recognize and be like, this is difficult. This is tough. But I know my God is good. And I know my God is going to get me through this. And I know that as hard as this Christmas might be, my God is going to get me through it. And he's going to surround me with people I trust. And there's ways to think about truth and understand truth in a pure, holy, God, holy, godly way where you go, I trust that God is good. And he's got more for me on the other side of this. And then I trust that I don't have to be manipulated by my emotions, but I can trust a God who's good enough that I will check my emotions based on his word. One, one scripture says that you want to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ? You want to take your emotions captive and make them obedient to Christ? Are they true? Are they good? You can have emotions that are based on falsehoods. You can think somebody said something about you that they didn't say, and you can fully be mad at them for something that didn't happen. Check your emotional state to say, is it true? Is it good? Is it holy? Is it pure? Because I'm, I'm not going to let it stand. I'm, I'm going to keep thinking about it, processing it until I get to the place where I'm going to think about the good things. I'm going to think on these things until my emotions are alert. Uh, we'll go back to that same scripture in 1 Peter chapter 5, 8. This is the original scripture. He tells us, be sober and alert. Your enemy, the devil, like a roaring lion, is on the prowl looking for someone to devour. He's looking for an opportunity. And, and the thing is that there's a way out. Verse 9 gives us the way out. That's that next verse over. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. You know that you can make it through because others have, and you know that Satan doesn't have as much power as you've been giving him credit. It, it, when, when it talks about, uh, in, in a scripture, and in, in actually 1 Corinthians 6 that we've talked about, it talks about fleeing sexual immorality. Get, run away from it. Get away from it as fast as you can. When it talks about Satan, it just says resist. Just don't go to him. I've already defeated him. You just don't, just don't pick him back up and dust him off and get, let him have power again. He's already been defeated. Our job is just to resist. Our job is just to think on the good things. Our job is just to give God the stuff. Our job is just to just trust God with, with his opinions and not man's opinions. And so for those of you today who are wrestling, just resist. Just stay where God has called you to be. Just stay in his hands. Don't, don't, don't trust man's opinion for your life. Trust God's. Don't trust your stuff to bring you joy. It's not going to work. Recognize what Scripture says for your joy and your strength and who you're called to be. And don't trust every emotion that comes your way. Check it with the Word of God and redirect it with the Word of God so that you stay in that line and that sweet spot where God has your heart softened 
moldable, ready to really celebrate Christmas the way it's supposed to be, ready to really live 2024 the way it's called to be, where you're in line with who God has called you to be and you're trusting him with every single step. Let's pray.